Good morning to Web War Brothers Log 43. We are, as always, continuing to world-build our fictional planet here, placeholder name Kretak. And in today's video, we're going to be continuing mapping weather events. But before we do that, I have an absolute truckload of follow-up to do. If you're not interested in that at all, here's a timestamp or use the chapters to skip around. First up, massive shout out to Fantasy World History Simulator. Wonderful YouTube channel. Go like, subscribe, smash bells, do what you gotta do. Their basic shtick is that they've been uh, building this kind of history simulator for the past five-ish years. They reached out to me and were like, hey, any chance I could take Kretak through the simulator? See what comes out. I was like, hells yeah. And then this is the result. Now, forgive me if it's a bit choppy. I might be recording at a weird frame rate relative to what you're seeing on screen. Rest assured, their video is smooth as hell. But it's so cool. Look at this. They've got population numbers in there. They've got like random name generators for all the various kind of polities. You got a simulated climate map. There's erosion going on to simulate rivers. How cool is that? So I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you go check this out, especially 624 that timestamp of the video. I checked that out. It's my favorite part. You might be like, hey, well, what does this mean? Are we now going to change our climate zone maps to match what is here? Are we going to change our river maps? Have we now got culture all worked out? And the answer is no. This is very much non-canon. Basically, anything we do here on the videos or that's on the website, artifactscene.com, more on that in a second, that's the kind of source of canon. But I am so here for people taking whatever's on the website and doing whatever they want to it. Like Fantasy World History Simulator has done here. Take it, mess with it, send it my way. I am so here for it. Fantasy World History Simulator, total boss. Speaking of the source of canon, the website has been updated. Look, it's got a shiny new footer. How impressive. But for real, I've finally gotten around to adding in all of the maps we've made. Oh, and I made a new one here just for, you know, the crack. A plate boundary map with all of the kind of rings of fire marked in. Lots of rings of fire going on in this world. Supercontinent reassembled stage. Who would have thunk it, eh? Now, I want to give mad props once again to Jay Choken. They created this little animation here of the Azani system, the system in which Kretak orbits. Really fun, amazing stuff. Thank you so much, Jay Choken. You've made it into the canon. Third shout out goes to wonderful denizen of the internet, a person called Matsunoki. They reached out a few weeks back and were like, hey, I've made a solar analemma calculator and here are the results for Kretak. And oh my God, just stunning. I won't be able to show you the whole video, it's 30 minutes long, but essentially what it is, is it's a animation of the solar analemma. And for anyone who doesn't know, that's kind of like, uh, if you go outside at the same time and at the same location and take a picture of the sun, like every day of the year, it'll trace a very particular path in the sky. That's what the analemma is, this uh, figure eight shape thing in the middle there. So we're tracking that and we're also tracking the day night cycle through the seasons. Just so, so, so cool. I would recommend going to the website and just scrubbing through to see how things change over the course of a single year on Kretak. Just, oh my God, Matsunoki, just amazing. And if that weren't baller enough, Matsunoki was like, hey, just here's the Desmos calculator, the program used to, to make this animation. Here it is and just give it to everyone. Everyone can use it. Now it is a bit, it's a bit dense. It's quite advanced. You need to know what you're doing, but if you do, you can head in here to all of the settings, tweak things, use it for your own world. And there you go. You have an accurate tracking of the year. How cool is that? Okay, any more cool people that I need to shout out? Oh yes, the meteorologists. So last video, tons of meteorologists. Actually, I lied. There was like two, maybe three meteorologists in the comments, which is two or three more than I think most YouTube videos get, which is so cool. The meteorologists came, they weighed in and they gave me tips and tricks. I'm not gonna go through everything here because there's a lot of text, but I just wanna shout out at Capri3101, pause and read the comment if you so desire, and at TFK underscore 001. Your advice has been taken on board, thank you so much, and I'll update the maps accordingly. Which actually, hold on, that means that the website hasn't been updated fully. I still have more maps to make. Oh well. I mean, this is what I do. Like, this is my life. I make maps. So the final thing I want to talk about before we start mapping proper is, like, what are we even doing here? I probably should have made this explicit, like, 10 videos ago. Uh, but here we are, better late than never, eh? It might seem that I'm just kind of, like, aimlessly world building and mapping, which is not entirely incorrect. 
but there is actually a goal here like there is a finish line as concerns this sort of like geofiction phase of the Cretac project and that is humans. Humans are the goal. So we're going to end the geofiction phase of this project by placing humans on Cretac. Now, a little design goal I set for myself here was to not have humans be cosmopolitan, as in they're not going to inhabit every nook and cranny of this world. They're, we're only going to drop them in like one, two, possibly three locations on the whole planet. You know, just for the sake of my sanity more than anything else. And the whole reason why we've done the tectonic stuff the climate zones, in the last video, the thunderstorms, the fog, the aurora, whatever we're going to do in this video, and then the two remaining topics in this geofiction phase, which are rocks and ore deposits. The reason why we're doing all that is to simply give us an idea of the environment of this world, and so I can make an informed call as to where I'd like these humans to go. Maybe we'll put them somewhere really nice, or more than likely, I'll probably just end up putting them somewhere extremely challenging. Because I am the god of this world, and what I say goes. So I guess all that is to say that there is a point. Every time I map something, I'm thinking, what's that mean for the environment and how could it also inform culture? Okay, hope that makes sense. Let's do some mapping. Oh, sorry, no, one last thing. Uh, I got a public Discord if anyone's interested. Very bare bones at the moment, but links in the usual places. Go check it out. Right, mapping. As is customary over here, we are going to follow Madeline James's wonderful world building guide, just like we did last time. Links in all the usual places. So the first thing I want to look at is the polar vortex affected regions. I'm not going to map these on air, much like fog from the previous video. You verbatim follow Madeline James's guide and you're grand. There's nothing for me to add here. A quick TLDR, I suppose, every so often, all this cold polar air will just make its way down to like the mid latitudes and just bring Baltic conditions with them. Anyone who lives in the US is more than familiar with the, the concept of the polar vortex. And to a first approximation, just land masses, the eastern side of land masses between about 30 and 50 degrees north and south could be subject to this polar vortex effect. That's what I marked in here, but honestly, this is even too much specificity. Like you could totally just circle and just make a note of yourself. Like, hey, in these regions, every so often you could just get like winters from hell. You definitely don't need to be too particular about that. All right, polar vortex done. Let's talk some hurricanes. Okay, hurricanes, AKA tropical cyclones. We all know what these are. I'm not gonna go into great detail. Basic stick here that these are tropical storms that form in tropical or subtropical oceans. They form on the Eastern side of these oceans and blow over to the West, making landfall in the West often to devastating effect. So my plan here is to make a map something like this. The key thing I'm looking for here is kind of formation areas, these orange blobs, and very, very, very highly abstracted uh, tropical storm paths. That's what I'm gonna try and emulate, which in fairness to Madeline is very similar to what she's got here, but we'll do a couple of little tweaks just because we're coming from different starting points. The usual, you know? So let's focus on Northern Hemisphere winter for the hurricanes. Now, very important, tropical cyclones and stuff are a sort of summer phenomena. So we're only gonna be looking at the summer hemisphere, which is the Southern Hemisphere in this case. So for each of the oceans, we need to make an evaluation as to whether or not we'll get tropical cyclones in those oceans. So let's pop over to this first ocean here. Let's whack on our wind maps and let's run the checks. Are we in summer? Yes, we are. Is this a tropical ocean? Yes, it is. Is the ITCZ, the dotted line here, in said tropical ocean in summer? Yes, it is. Is this ocean warm? Now to evaluate that last one, we're gonna to need to whack on our uh, ocean current maps like this. And basically all we're gonna ask is, is polar water, water from like near or within the polar circle, getting into the system? If not, it's warm and we can have like a maximal hurricane uh, formation zone going on. And in this case, we don't have any polar water from the very, very high latitudes getting into the system. So this is a kind of maximally warm tropical ocean. That means we can now mark in a formation zone. Now, hurricanes won't form within five degrees of the equator because of the Coriolis effect. So basically, all I'm going to do is I'm, well, first of all, actually, I'm going to throw on my uh, temperature map here uh, because I like to skew the formation zones towards the hottest part of the ocean. So that would be this purple zone here. This is 27 plus degrees. So I'm going to basically just start at about five degrees, which is kind of in line with the ITZZ here. 
This is a maximally warm ocean, so I'm going to start all the way back at this coast here. I'm just going to draw somewhat straight line across like this till we meet land. And then I'm going to just come down here and vaguely follow this hot zone. Don't have to stick to it precisely, but just vaguely something like, like that. We'll call that a formation zone. Awesome. So let's evaluate this stretch of ocean. Winds on. Is it summer? Yes. Is it a tropical ocean? Yes. Is the ITCZ in the tropical ocean in summer? Yes. Is it warm? So again, we whack on our ocean currents layer. And there's an argument we made here that this ocean would be like air quotes colder than what we had just drawn here to, to the west. Reason being that, look, this southern gyre here touches this gyre here. That'll have some sort of like cooling effect because we have water coming in from very low latitudes here. Similarly, this gyre here, some of this water will kind of come up through here as well. So it's kind of directly coming from the more kind of poleward regions. So there's going to be a significant cooling effect, at least on the eastern side of this ocean. So I would expect then that the formation zone for these hurricanes would not begin on the coast of Degra, but might begin halfway uh, across the ocean. I say this because I measured this length of ocean off camera and it's, it's almost identical to the Atlantic. And you see in the Atlantic, we just get no hurricane formation at all, really, during the southern summer. But we do have a whole bunch of proper polar water coming up along the west coast of Africa here. And that kind of nerfs all of that. We don't really have the same analog here. So I figured, you know what, instead of having no hurricanes form here, I'm just going to push them off to like halfway in the ocean. Kind of like what's happening between South America and Australia. So temps on, there's our blob, no less than five degrees from the equator. So something like this perhaps. Okay, I'm gonna rinse and repeat that for the other two uh, sections of ocean here. I'm not gonna do it in time-lapse. It really is the same thing over and over again. So through the magic of YouTube editing, here's all of our formation zones also changed the color here because that that orange is a bit too orange a little bit extra oh actually now that i see this do you know what this bay here right i'm getting a little bit of like indian ocean vibes from this you know this sort of malark going on in here and there is a really hot bit of ocean there. i might actually just extend this over just to fill up this bay a little bit Now we're cooking, let's do some paths. Now, the basic shtick here will be that our uh, hurricanes, our tropical cyclones, will form on the eastern sides of our formation zones. They'll travel westward, but due to the Coriolis effect, they'll gradually get pulled poleward and eastward. You can see that reflected here in abstraction, but even in the more to life data, you can see this sort of movement going on. So we're going to emulate that. Let's focus on just maybe this ocean here for the time being. Uh, let's whack on our temperature maps. And it really is a simple case of just starting a line in the east, dragging it along to the west, and then turning it poleward and perhaps back eastward. And despite this being an abstract thing, what I would recommend though is that these paths don't cross the 18 degree isotherm with these paths. Like the idea is that again, these are kind of tropical phenomena, so they require warm conditions. Eventually it's just gonna get too cold to support a proper like tropical cyclone. And we'll just call that the 18 degree line. So I guess something uh, a little like this then. Okay, that's not too bad. Rinse and repeat for all the other zones. Northern Hemisphere winter, aka Southern Hemisphere summer, done. Here's one I prepared earlier. This is what the hurricane paths look like in the other half of the year when it's summer in the north. Same basic deal. So unlike Earth, with its for the most part nice open oceans, Kretak here loves itself some horizontal land masses. So basically all along here kind of would get buffeted by hurricanes in the summer because it is well within the 18 degree isotherm, all of this. And this has the neat effect of a bunch of CFB climate zones. Again, think the Greater Scilly Isles, Ireland, England, Scotland, that sort of jazz. Bunch of CFB climate zones, except with proper hurricanes, which isn't really a thing we see on Earth. Like, yeah, sure, like bits in New Zealand and Eastern Australia and the Greater Scilly Isles up here, 
they do get kind of the remnants of these tropical storms, but not proper hurricanes in the same way that the southeastern U uh, US gets, you know, which is pretty cool. Torrential year round rain plus hurricanes in the summer. How delightful. What a wonderful place to live. Now, on a related note, let's now map some strong winds. Now, Ala Madeline strong winds are tied to the polar and subtropic jet streams. These boils here, these are essentially uh, west east flowing currents of air in the upper atmosphere at like 10 kilometers up. These go like the clappers, like off the coast of Japan here on was it the 21st of January 2014. They clocked in at like 370 kilometers per hour, which I don't know about you, but that is not slow. Now we have a problem, right? If strong winds are tied to the circulation of the upper atmosphere and we do not have that mapped, what do we do? The answer is not to map the upper atmosphere. I don't know of any world builder who has ever attempted that. Actually, what am I saying? If anyone's done something like this, it's probably world building pasta. I mean, what has the man not done? Links in the description, go check it out. If, if for whatever reason you've been living under a rock and you've not read world building pasta's blog, you are in for a treat, my friend. Anyhow, I digress. We don't have this mapped. So we're gonna have to rely on our surface circulation maps to try and figure out how strong winds work, which is something that Madeline does. She ties her strong winds to her subpolar and subtropic wind belts that occur at about 30 degrees north and south and at about 50 to 60 degrees north and south. Now myself and herself, we have two very different atmospheric circulation maps going on. So I can't really tie strong winds to latitude in the same way that Madeline does. So here's the game plan. If we take another Gandhi goo at Earth here, and we note that green here means strong wind, we'll see that basically all of the strong winds on the planet occur kind of in conjunction with, or as a result of circulation cells in the atmosphere over the oceans. Like here, 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 here. And we can note here that the really strong winds occur at higher latitudes. So with those two observations in mind, how about we say that strong winds are generated by oceanic atmospheric circulation cells, if and only if, one, the winds associated with those cells are allowed to blow over water for an extended period of time, and two, these winds are not too far within the tropics. Like the clo again, the closer we get to the equator, the less strong the winds are going to be. And the, the idea behind the ocean thing here is that the, the friction between the air and the water is fairly minimal at least with respect to the friction between the air and the land. So winds blowing over an extended chunk of ocean have the ability to like gain a bunch of momentum and then they can smash into the land and make landfall as strong winds. On, on Kretak here, just to further demonstrate, we're in Northern Hemisphere winter once again. If I zoom into this circulation cell, I would imagine that this section of coast up here would get buffeted by strong winds because this pressure zone is throwing off a whole bunch of winds, traveling over the ocean for an extended period of time, picking up a bunch of momentum, slamming into land, strong winds. That's the opposite of what's going on here in Janar. We have a similar circulation cell, except it's on the land, no ocean involved, so we can't really pick up a whole bunch of speed. So basically all of this would not be subject to strong winds. So that's uh, basically where our strong winds are gonna come from. Next thing is uh, we just need to talk about what we're gonna do when these strong winds hit the land. And then I promise I'll start mapping. Essentially, if there's little islands in the way of these strong winds, they get marked as having strong winds. Like say, maybe here, for example. If the strong winds encounter relatively flat plains, their effect will extend inland a great deal. Again, this is a result of comparatively low friction. And finally, if there's a coastal mountain range like this boyo here, the strong wind effect will only extend up until the mountain for the most part. But every so often, if there's like a gap in the mountain range, that'll act like a funnel. Kind of like, you know, if you've got a garden hose and you put your finger half covering the hose and turn on the water, the pressure increases. There's a stronger flow. Same thing would basically happen. So you might get little corridors of strong winds kind of breaking through the mountain. But for the most part, they'll be limited to just the low-lying coastal area. I'm going to do one big old time lapse marking in these strong winds. See you in a bit.
All right, strong winds done. I, I may have overcooked a couple of things here. Like I'm looking at you, Janar. Like the entire northern half of this continent is subject to strong winds, which is which kind of is not really a thing we see on Earth. But like we got winds coming off this ocean. We got winds coming off this bay. We got winds coming off this bay here. I'm also saying that winds coming off the uh, sea ice here would also be quite strong. Sea ice being comparatively smooth, less friction, etc. Kind of gives rise to this entire chunk being subject to strong winds. And in any case, it's, it's worth noting this is all like a prerequisite to the next step, which is blizzards and sandstorms and things like that. So I'm, I'm more than happy to have overcooked that because I can totally see blizzards occurring basically anywhere in this northern half of Janar, you know? So next up on the strong wind agenda are catabatic winds. These are, well, strong winds, oftentimes hurricane force winds. Like you get them down in Antarctica and they blow at like 300 kilometers per hour, which is like racing car speed, nuts. So the basic mechanism here is that if you're in a cold region of the planet and you have a bunch of cold air at elevation, that cold air is going to blow down slope and as it does so it's going to warm but because we're in a cold region that warming air is going to be warmer than the air at the surface so you get like this uh, temperature inversion thing going on which contributes or which helps make these catabatic winds so strong so for our mapping what we're going to need to look for is cold regions where you have either an ice shelf like a substantial ice shelf or a substantial mountain plateau. Any place where you got like a lot of cold air sitting up high. So for example, what immediately springs out to me here is this kind of northern half of the Esri Plateau. Big, big plateau, cold regional planet, great. We whack on our wind and pressure map and anywhere where we have winds blowing down the slope, so in the lee of a big plateau or ice shelf, we can mark in some catabatic winds, like so. dead easy so i'm gonna bop around the map putting in these winds chat to you in a bit all right order up northern hemisphere winter catabatic winds And finally, let's talk fern winds, aka fern winds or fain winds or fawn winds. A whole bunch of pronunciation variation going on here. I'm going to honor my ancestors and stick with the German pronunciation fern. These are, you can almost think of these as the reverse of kind of catabatic winds. Catabatic winds is like a bunch of cold air up high flowing down slope. As previously noted, fern winds are a bunch of warm air up high flowing down slope. So these are rain shadow winds. These occur in the rain shadow of mountains or mountain ranges. Air blows on the windward side of the mountain. As it overtops the mountain or mountain range, a bunch of energy is created. This creates heat. So you got warm winds blowing down slope into the lee side or the rain shadow of the mountain. And this will promote like cloudless skies and sunny conditions in the rain shadow. So there's numerous effects here. Like this can take an already hot region. These fern winds can take an already hot region and just ramp up the heat to an extreme extent. Like other winds we've discussed, they can be quite strong. So in dry regions, they can promote like and promote and spread wildfires. And in cold regions, they can promote avalanches. Warm winds, sudden melting of snow. You get it. So fern winds can basically go in the rain shadow of any mountain range. Like if there's a rain shadow, you could just say fern winds occur there. But you want to bias it towards mountain ranges that have moist air on the windward side. Or alternatively, if you have a bunch of dry air coming in from up high. So let's, let's say there's a bunch of dry air sitting on a plateau. It can come down as a fern wind. So it's a little bit redundant to mark in fern winds because you'd be kind of marking in the rain shadow of every single mountain. That said, in an effort to save time off camera, I went ahead and just sketched in areas here that stuck out to me. This is by no means exhaustive. These purple areas here are fern winds. Windward side of the mountain, nice and moist. Leeward side of the mountain, the rain shadow, fern winds. So those are our strong winds in Northern Hemisphere winter. And here we are in Northern Hemisphere summer. Delightful. Right, let's talk blizzards. For blizzards, I, I broadly agree with Madeline here. They mainly occur in winter and in strong wind regions, makes sense. 
but it's worth, I think, broadening the climate zone limitation here to all D climates and all E climates, all continental and all polar climates, not just the, uh, the very coldest of the D climates. So, dead easy, let's go. Those are all my winter hemisphere strong wind regions. Now I'm just going to raise anything that's not in a D or E climate. Perfect. Now let's talk sandstorms. Similarly with the sandstorms, I broadly agree with Madeline here. They'll be a summer phenomena on our maps, limited to the summer hemisphere. They'll occur in deserts. I would extend that to semi-arid regions as well, so steppes. And large flat land. Uh-huh. And definitionally deserts would be dry and devoid of vegetation. This last bit, I think, is a typo. Alright, regardless, I don't agree with this, so we're not going to be tying sandstorms to storm risk. Just summer hemisphere, semi-arid or arid climate zone large flat land. Let's do this. Okay, order up on Sandstorm, uh, now for the dessert. The final course, Dust Storms. Now for Dust Storms, we're going to need to tweak things a little bit. Mainly because we don't have an aridity map, and I don't want to tie things to storms. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw on my Summer Precipitation Map, make a selection of all the precipitation, then throw on my Winter Precipitation Map and add that to the selection, invert that selection, and fit it in with our Dust Storm colour. These are all of the regions on the planet that don't receive significant precipitation throughout the year. That is, fairly dry regions. Like sandstorms, dust storms are a summer hemisphere phenomena, at least for us. So I am going to select everything in the winter hemisphere here and yeet that. Delightful. In our B climate regions, we have sandstorms marked in, so we need to get rid of that from the selection. And then going to get rid of all the E climates, so tundra and polar climates. Final thing we need to do is get rid of anything that doesn't feel like it's a large flat plain. And then we're done. That is dust, sandstorms and blizzards done. Here's what it looks like in Northern Hemisphere winter. Off camera, I did Northern Hemisphere summer and it looks like this. And with that, that is weather finalized. As mentioned at the start of the video, next up we're going to tackle rocks and then ore deposits, and then we're functionally done with the geofiction phase of the project. So I hope you join me in the next one. Thanks a million for watching. Thanks to the patrons for supporting the channel. Shout out Madeline for her wonderful, wonderful guide. Links in the usual places. Ongoing shout out to the wonderful Ross Bay Geo for the continued geographic advice. And yeah, have a great one, folks. Until next time, it grouse.